to our sponsors. Of course, GovCon is a free event, and it would not be possible without all of our, uh, I think, 20-something to 30 sponsors, so that's pretty cool. Um, but though they are sponsoring Drupal for Gov, they don't necessarily, this is not an endorsement from me or anyone I may work for. <laughs> All right, so today we're here for science can tell you how to clone a T-Rex, humanities can tell you why that might be a bad idea, AI edition. So kind of a mouthful. Um, first of all, can everyone hear me? Okay, no microphone, but it's a small room, so. Um, I don't know if people were familiar with this or maybe questioning what's up with the T-Rex, uh, but around 2014, there was a meme poster thing going around from the University of Utah that had a giant T-Rex and a tiny little scientist running away scared um, with the main text here, minus the AI edition. Um, and so just a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek, humanities get crapped on a lot, so we're like, hey, we matter too. Um, and that's kind of where I'm coming from here as we're discussing AI. It's not just, hey, here's this really cool technology and let's just use it because we can and it's awesome. Um, it's like, let's, you know, think about it first. Um, so, uh, I also will say that thoughts and opinions are my own and not necessarily reflective of my employer. All right. Um, and I am also using AI locally as an umbrella term for generative AI, not necessarily, you know, neural implants or self-driving cars or what have you. Uh, just colloquially, as we say AI, mostly we're talking about generative AI in this zeitgeist. guys. <laughs> all right, um, so first of all, a couple questions for the room. How many of you have used generative AI? ChatGPT, Copilot, Gemini? Is that everybody? I think that's everybody. Did, have you used it? A, a little bit, okay, so everybody has used it. Okay, cool. Um, can you share some of the reasons why you used it for work or fun, yeah? Because uh, my bosses at work are involved with it, it's said that we should all use it for different reasons. Okay, cool. Boss said go ahead and use it. Yeah? I cloned a cabinet secretary's voice, said we're full-time telework, and said to tell <laughs> Okay, clone, uh, maybe not advisable, but cloning uh, cabinet, cabinet secretary's voices to uh, promote work from home. Very good. Um, I approve <laughs> Anything else? Uh, any any good uses? These all sound kind of fun, but well, I guess the work one, right? Yeah. I've used it for um, helping to compose like thoughts out of paragraph format from like bullets to give me an idea of what that might look like. Okay, so taking your personal thoughts and then trying to kind of draft it out, compose some stuff in bullets. Okay, cool. Um, did you have good results with the generative AI? I'm getting some. Some, uh, I don't know what to call that, hand iffy. mixed iffy, <laughs> some iffy results, some shaking heads. Uh, yeah? I, I just would, from my perspective, I'd say the results were, you know, so so. Uh -huh. But I'm mentally fully expecting it's going to get better and better. Okay, okay, cool. So, if you, yeah? No, I found one of the things I like is when I just code, code comments for me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the coding itself. I can't trust as well. Okay, so code comments, yay, code nay. Um, I think I also forgot to say that I'm kind of across a uh, web developer and corporate AI just enthusiast. <laughs> um, all right, so did anyone have any like ridiculous results? Like, you know, I, I know there were some going around from Google's efforts that were talking about, someone asked it, you know, hearkening back to some kind of Looney Tune, they said, how, how far can a human run off a cliff? And Gemini responded, as long as they don't look down, they're not going to fall. Has anyone <laughs> any experience with those kinds of things? Or just like wrong code, maybe? Yeah, wrong code, definitely. It okay. won't ever tell me it doesn't know. Right, so, right, right. Yeah. Yes, okay. Just save it. Okay, so we've got definitely some use, some so-so use. Um, but we are, we're all pretty much using it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's the fun part. It, it tells you something, you try it, it doesn't work, and you say, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, yeah, that's fine. Oh, usually it's, in my experience, it's apologetic. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then, uh, not a great segue, but we're at a Drupal conference, right? Uh, this is GovCon, this is the third day. Um, have you all enjoyed it? Are you all yeah. having having a blast? I'm having a blast. Yes. Um, 
do we have any Drupal contributors? Like even, you know, have you reported an issue? Okay, about half the room. Um, does anyone have any, like no one made you do that, right? Did you have any reason to, what was your motivation behind contributing? First time. Sure, yeah, first time uh, contributor. My boss said that you should uh, contribute this as a module on Drupal uh, back in 2007. But why did he say that? Or she, so your boss. <laughs> So long. I probably am going to get it wrong, but um, I think uh, to reduce the, the maintenance cost of uh, things in the site. Okay, so you're seeking other input, is is what it sounds like. Right, right. Okay, so contributing a module to try to get feedback and input from other contributors. Um, yeah. Because I wanted help with a problem. That you you wanted help with a problem. It was about getting to get fixed. Okay, okay. Um, yes? I was looking up something related. I was looking up something and I found a question parallel to it that I actually knew the answer to. It was like, all right, we'll stop okay. and answer this and then I'll continue. Okay. So. Does anybody do it to like have that on your little profile and just, you know, hey, she <laughs> contributed or he contributed? Okay, so a couple people, right? Uh, does anybody do it because it, I guess these are the reasons why I do it and I'm asking if you do it for the same reasons, but. Um, I like to help people, and I think it's cool that this is an open source thing where we're all coming together to create this crazy, insane, cool thing that anybody can use. Um, so I guess those are my reasons, but cool, thank you. All right, uh, so now I've got a couple. These are taken from uh, Microsoft Copilot, which runs on ChatGPT4. Uh, these are prompts that they suggested that we could use to create AI-generated content, so such as share some fascinating facts about ocean tides, Compose a pop song about an astronaut returning to Earth. Not David Bowie's version, but just like a new one, I guess. Um, invent a new fusion recipe that combines Italian and Japanese cuisines. Um, so what are we feeling? Are we feeling like these are good prompts, a good use of AI? Is it not a good use? Is it, would you do some of these things, possibly? Not that you've suggested it. Huh? Not that you've suggested it. Now that I've suggested, okay, well, that's probably why Copilot says, hey, try this, try that, right? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so uh, this next slide, let's see the reaction. Oh, does it, oh, okay. Do we know, well, do we get what this is? Yeah. A captcha? Yeah. Um, so can anyone tell me how many dogs are in, or is in this captcha that I've created? Five, seven, seven, eight, 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 you know, I'm sure we've all done captures, and personally, when I see that bicycle, I'm like, are the handlebars part of the bike? Is the wheel part of the bike? Yes. I don't. Is it? I don't know. I click them, and then it doesn't go, and then I have to do, do it you again. I no. I I always click on the handlebars, yeah, but it's it's always uh, I'm sure. <laughs> all right, so that's the intro, and now let's get into the main event, I suppose, the hidden costs of AI. And these are just a few, and some of them are less hidden than others. Um, some of them, you know, you've probably heard about in the news. Uh, maybe you're familiar with all of them, maybe you know more. Um, I would welcome you to share those, but uh, again, I'm just talking about generative AI here, and uh, let's go to the first one. So there's legal and trust costs. People have been fired for using generative AI. There was a very prominent news that came out about a lawyer who uh, used it to generate his uh, legal citations. So as a kind of lower level newbie lawyer, he didn't know to verify or check, I guess, that those were made up case law, um, but it was very apparent to the other side and they immediately had it thrown out and then he was fired um, for using that hallucinated case law. 
Um, then also people have been sued and or fined, which that was also a couple of lawyers who were using, again, made up cited case law. Um, that sounds pretty good and wasn't actually real at all, which is kind of easily verifiable. And those were, those were back in 2023, I think early 2023. So it was kind of the advent. So people weren't as familiar with the hallucinatory effects of AI. Um, and then also people could be held liable. Uh, there was a case where a Canadian airline tried to claim that they were not responsible for their chatbot. The chatbot was, I guess, sentient of some level, um, and it was responsible for its content and not the airline. Um, and there was a person who tried to get a, they have a bereavement fair where they have a reduced fair if, if you've lost a loved one. Um, and the chatbot told the man that he could get it after the fact. He could fly and then claim his reduced fare, um, whereas the website clearly stated, no, you have to do it before you fly. Um, but he took him to court and said, hey, this is what your chatbot told me, and the judge agreed. <laughs> the judge was like, this was on your website. It doesn't matter that the content elsewhere on the site was factual. This is what you told this person, and you claimed that it could take the place of your support team. So we're gonna stand by this. Um, so it's just a reminder that you are responsible for any of the content that your chatbot generates, at least in Canada. I don't know if we've had any litigation in the United States along those lines. New York City might be next as their chatbot has had some issues with uh, telling people to break the law when it comes to businesses. Um, so we'll see if anything happens there. Um, and then, we're going to go into misinformation political costs. So this one I feel like is probably less hidden. It's talked about in the news frequently. Um, I believe the most recent thing I heard was uh, someone was sending around a video of Kamala Harris saying that she, uh, you know, all this made up stuff and, and the original poster said it was parody, but then people weren't including that it was generated AI and that it was parody as they were reposting it. Um, We've got deep fakes of, there was a, you know, and largely this is from politicians and celebrities, but it can affect regular people as well. There was a principal in um, Maryland who was recently fired because there was a deep fake of his voice saying very inappropriate things that got him in trouble and uh, he was fired. And luckily for him, they found out that it was a deep fake and that somebody, I, I think it was an employee dispute thing. Someone was upset with the way they had handled um, an employee interaction. So they set him up with this deep fake and had him on record saying all these inappropriate things. Um, so deep fakes are definitely affecting, you know, there's, there's a lot of scams going around where people's voices um, are being used to circumvent their banking systems. You know, you pick up a cold call from maybe a telemarketer, maybe someone recording you and you say hello, and maybe you say yes. Um, then they can record these things and, and use them against you to, to access your banking. Um, and then there's also probably the more, I mean, it's a smaller thing, but it's, everybody can kind of do it. The accidental or malicious spreading of defects in AI and misinformation, um, it can just, you know, proliferate and, and some people, you know, some people think they can catch it every single time and that's just not the case. Often we can, you know, we see like a crooked elbow or a weird hand, it's like, oh, that's AI. Um, and certainly there is that kind of, in my experience, there's a distrust now of things that you see online, like more so than, than, than we've had in the past where people just kind of go into things suspicious that maybe this isn't what it seems to be. Um, there was a, 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 what is it called, a trailer. There was a trailer for uh, a documentary that used AI generated footage and people immediately jumped on it and were commenting, this is AI, why didn't you say this is AI? Um, we can clearly tell it's AI. <laughs> Uh, but then there was another study that I think Mozilla did where they just kind of asked people in the community who would know these things as like tech people, you would think. Um, and they gave them three images and asked which one is the generated AI version. Um, and most of them got it wrong. Uh, so, you know, we can't always tell. 
Um, actually, I want to go back to that real quick because I'll, I'll tell a personal anecdote real quick. Um, I've been caught up in this. Um, I was in a class talking about spa, like the word, like I'd go to the spa, right? And in Polish, we capitalize it S-P-A. So then there was a class for, for Polish learners and uh, people started asking, why is it all caps? Why is it an acronym? And then we started thinking, does it stand for something? Because, you know, Americans or English speakers, we have laser. That's an acronym that actually, you know, you can spell out. Um, so I started digging into it. And I was like, oh my gosh, spa. Have we just never known this the whole time? Um, and so I just quickly looked it up while the class was happening. So I wasn't doing my due diligence. And there was the little generated pop-up that said, oh, yeah, spa means uh, some kind of Latin for sanctus something aguam, like uh, healing water. And that sounds right, right? Like, oh yeah, you go to the spa to get healed. And so I told everybody in this class, I was like, how did we never think of this spa? Like, English speakers, like, why don't we know this? And then, you know, everybody was shocked. And, and then I started, you know, I wanted to share it with someone else later. And then I realized that the thing had come from a spa website, <laughs> like, like to go, so it was some kind of marketing campaign, right? So of course you're gonna, that's a good marketing spiel. Um, and then I started looking into it and it's a backronym, like where someone, so acronyms have only existed since like the late 1800s, early 1900s in the English language. Um, and spa has existed longer than that. So there's no way that it's an acronym for this Latin term. Um, and it's likely just named after a city in Belgium or something. So it's not an acronym. Don't take that away from here. But, you know, even me, who's like, I'm always constantly telling, like, the older folks in my life, like, don't click on the ads. Like, the first thing you see on Google, don't click on it. Like, it could be malicious. We just got an email. The, there was a federal thing going around where one of the, uh, what is it called, employee payment portal things, um, someone was buying malicious ads and advertising, hey, yeah, come here, and you click it, and you can input all your information, and it's not that, it's, it's just a, an ad that they let them buy. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're on to environmental costs. Um, this one's, like, there's some awareness, I feel, but I feel like this is probably one of the most hidden costs, just because that's the way it has been. Like, with the advent of the cloud, we called it the cloud, right? The, the cloud is not bad for the environment, it's just floating up there. Right? Nobody's, nobody's doing it, it's just existing in the cloud. So it's perfectly fine, right? And meanwhile, no, there's all these servers that someone's actually maintaining and taking care of and taking a toll on all of our resources. It's not just happily floating around. <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I feel has been done uh, you know, with the internet as a whole. We don't really talk about how environmentally draining it is, but especially with AI, it's just going to exponentially increase the costs. Um, so first of all, there's the learning. As you're teaching the model, that's a huge drain. Especially the bigger your model gets, it costs more in water. Um, and that you know might sound weird if you're not familiar, and you're like, what, are these servers drinking water? Uh, but it's, it's cooling. All of these servers need to be cooled, especially if they're literally in the desert in Arizona, um, where it's 100 degrees and you need a lot of water to cool those servers. Um, and so there's that upfront cost. Well, there's also the hardware costs, right? You have to build all of these servers and these chips and um, everything that goes into that. And then there's the learning. And then after that, there's the consistent use. Um, and there, we're, people are still out there doing analysis and research, but um, people have said that a Question to an AI, um, I think this one was specifically for, um, I think this one was specifically ChatGPT with OpenAI. Um, they compared, no, I'm sorry, this was Google. This was a Google search versus a Google Gemini uh, AI overview. So the Google search, the AI overview was 30 times the energy use. So like a Google search, was like 0 0.003 kilowatts per hour, something like that. Um, and then the, the Google Gemini overview was 30 times that, um, just for one little conversation. So it's an exponential increase, 30 times. Um, and then the 
Microsoft data centers, to speak specifically about open AI this time, um, in 2019, one data center was expected to consume 50 million gallons of water in a year. 50 million in one year. And then on top of that, they, in 2021, said that they were planning to build 50 to 100 new data centers every year. So that's now 50 million times 50 times potentially 100. Um, and then if we talk specifically about ChatGPT, we know that they have over 100 million active monthly users. Um, so we all here have used AI. Um, and, you know, if we just use it once a month, we're now eating up 12.5 million gallons of water every month. If we use it every day, now that's 660,000 gallons, which is, uh, I'm sorry, there's a whole math here. So 660 gallons is one Olympic swimming pool, because um, everybody likes to do that, we like to compare things to things we can kind of grasp. So there's uh, now 20 Olympic swimming pools in a month. And then in, I'm sorry, that's if you have one conversation a month. Now we're having one conversation a day. So now in a month, it's 568 Olympic swimming pools, which is 375 million gallons of water in one month. So we went from 50 million for one little data center to now one generative AI is 300, using up 375 million gallons if people are having one conversation a day. Maybe people are having 10. Maybe only half the users are having a conversation a day. So, you know, it depends and we don't have the hard facts, because obviously they're not really supplying those. Um, but if you drank a gallon of water a day, it would take you 1,027,397 years to consume as much as ChatGPT may in a month. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, good stuff. Um, and then there's also, so that's, that's just the water, and then I talked about the electricity with the 30 times the energy. And then there's the environmental equity issue of these server farms are not being distributed equitably. They're going to places, I mean, some, sometimes they're you know, thinking through these things, but Phoenix, Arizona does not have a lot of water. And yet here we are putting data centers in Arizona where people already don't have access to water. Um, and they're actually looking to build a pipeline from Mexico up to Phoenix and desalinate ocean water and then pipeline it all the way up across another sovereign country. It's bonkers. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so people who are already environmentally disadvantaged are now having these server farms placed in you know, exponentially increasing the environmental degradation to their area. Uh, now we're on to human and societal costs. So there is the exploitation of labor we could think about. Um, these things, you know, maybe everyone here knows, but uh, I'm assuming a lot of the world is not aware that AI doesn't just do it, right? Like, it's not just smart enough to know how things work. We have to train it. We have to teach it. And there are people out there who are literally telling these machines, like, hey, this is a TV. I am a person. That's a chair. That's a bag. This is a floor. So all of those little cleaning robots that are going around your house, they taught those by taking pictures. So they were just constantly taking pictures and they actually trained the original model with, they, they got these approvals from the people who were having them in their homes and they said like, yes, you can take pictures of my home, but I'm assuming either people forgot or they didn't read the fine print um, because there were employees who had to review these images. And in these images, people were seeing people walking around their house naked, children running through the house naked, people on the toilet, their animals, their cats, like people just living their lives and not thinking that this little thing was taking pictures of them. Because we don't, we don't think about that, right? Like it, it just knows. It's just a cute little robot that just sweeps my floor for me, you know? Like people aren't thinking about that. And then these employees had a chat service that they were using where they would post up these photos and say like, oh, look at this person that I found. And then someone leaked all of those photos. So now there were, you know, not great images running around out there. Um, and, uh, you know, the people who are having to do that, who are having to look through these 
sometimes like, you know, you don't want to see your neighbor naked in their house. And now they're having to look through all of this data and they're having to like bounding box everything to say exactly what it is. Um, and they're being paid like one one thousandth of a cent per task. So if I said that's a chair, I'm going to get one one thousandth of a penny. And I'm going to go more into that. But um, there's also equity in education to think about and the loss of career and personal growth. So, you know, the students who are going to elite colleges who have the time and the ability and are not working multiple jobs um, because they have money and they have the time to explore and to learn and to grow, they're not using chat GPT. They don't, they don't need to. Whereas the students who are overworked and they've got two or three jobs and they're trying to learn and seize good degrees, they're using ChatGPT just to get the paper. And then they're not actually getting to learn. Um, and then like similar, similarly with career and personal growth, if you don't, like human understanding and learning is, is problem solving. And if you don't get to problem solve because you take, you know, everybody says use, you say, yeah, it's great. It'll, it'll figure it out for you. Then you're not, you're not getting to learn. Um, and we're losing those mid, those entry level jobs, um, that are going to AI and, you know, data entry or to bring up the lawyers again, they're, they're losing some paralegals and some of those entry level things, because instead of a human having to go through and look through case law, they're now just asking the computer to do it. Um, and then you're losing out on the context because it's, it's a computer that's searching through things, but if you read through a document and you find 20 mentions of Canada, okay, that, that means nothing. But if you can look at the context and suddenly Canada's mentioned, I don't know, next to milk or something, then you, you can pick up context and you can see that there's actually more meaning than the computer is able to give you. And then there's also the algorithmic and human and implicit bias, which is another thing that I'm sure people have heard of. Um, we can kind of, you know, there's some jokey things where we can talk about how hand washing faucets can't see darker skinned people, right? Um, but then that can translate into real world problems where suddenly biometric facial tracking is not able to see and differentiate darker skinned people. And so now people are being arrested for crimes they didn't commit because, well, the biometrics told us that you were this person. And if we're not teaching people how AI works and if we're not having transparency around it, then people don't know how fallible it is. And so people, you know, like it's a computer, it's smarter than me, right? Like that's what people are thinking. So they're just gonna go with it and you need to give people that information up front that like this AI does have faults. Um, there was one thing where uh, doctors were given x-rays and the AI was built, and this isn't generative, but I'll talk about it anyway. The AI was built to, to scan these x-rays and see if there was a cancerous <coughs> something or other in the x-ray. Um, and they, the doctors were not told that the x-ray was only 60% uh, fallible or whatever, and, and there, there were false positives. So they weren't told about the false positives. They were just told, hey, it works this percent of the time. So they were given 40 instead of 100 of these things to review, which they thought would reduce their time, but they were given some false positives, but they weren't aware that there could be false positives. So they actually spent more time on 40 than they did on 100 because they kept thinking, well, the AI must have seen something I'm not seeing. So they just kept second guessing themselves. Um, all right, so we'll go back to exploitation of labor. So this is you know, what I was talking about with the tight bounding box around the person. Um, so this is a real task. Uh, I didn't want to screenshot somebody's you know, device, but this is a mock-up of what it looks like when you're using one of these tasks um, by these companies that have people train the AI. Uh, so you get an image, you're told to create a bounding box. There would be like little tools up here so you could select whatever uh, polygon you want. And then down, down here, you would see your price. So you're making one one thousandth of a penny to do one little bounding box. So if you do 80,000 of them, you'll make $80. And if you think about doing that in, um, I have my math here somewhere. Uh, okay. 
So 80,000 tasks at maybe five seconds per task, probably some people can do it faster, um, but that would be like 404,000 seconds of this, which would be 14 eight hour days, and you would only earn $80. So that really fun captcha at the beginning with the dogs, and you know, would you want to do that for this, for $80 every day? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> Um, and the problem is that they are a global operation, so they can just kind of pick up and move whenever they find cheaper labor. Um, so they've been, you know, they'll, they had some uh, jobs in East Africa, in Venezuela, in India, in Colombia. Um, they even went to refugee camps in Lebanon and uh, were paying people, you know, desperate people who, who need money, but, you know, it's, it's exploitation because... Uh, Nobody wants to sit there and do that for $80. All right, uh, this one has also been kind of in the news recently uh, with Scarlett Johansson, if anyone's familiar. Uh, intellectual property and content creation costs. So this goes to, you know, at the, the top, copyright infringement lawsuits. Uh, a lot of these AI systems, Stability, Dolly, they're currently being sued. Um, the top music ones are currently being sued because people think that it's infringed on their copyright. Um, Getty Images has a really good, I think, case um, because the, uh, I think it's Stability that they're specifically suing. Um, Stability will spit out images that have, if you're familiar with Getty, they have this little like square here with a filled in and it says Getty Images. Um, so people are asking for photos of tennis players or whatever, and the AI will try to put out that little Getty watermark. So it's clear that they have trained and scraped Getty image images. <laughs> um, there's also the concern with losing the right to publicity. So I can't make a pharmaceutical and then say, put a picture of Dr. Oz and say, yeah, Dr. Oz supports my pharmaceutical. I can't do that, that's illegal. But are we going to continue those laws when it comes to AI-generated content? Are we going to allow people like Scarlett Johansson to own her voice? Um, there was an issue with OpenAI where they wanted to create a voice assistant and they really wanted to get Scarlett Johansson's voice because the head of OpenAI loves her. Uh, the movie, not, not Scarlett Johansson specifically. Um, and she said no. She she didn't want to just allow them to just use her voice uh, without her consent, without compensation. Um, and there's some question about whether they did or didn't. <laughs> um, but it sounds it sounds pretty close. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's that that right to publicity. That I mean, we had a whole Hollywood strike where the writers and the actors and everybody was coming together because generative AI could just capture your likeness and then use you in perpetuity for whatever they wanted, for images or videos or advertising. Um, and, you know, Hollywood actors didn't want that. So there, there was a strike and the, the gaming industry is now striking for similar things um, with their likeness and voice actors. Um, you know, you don't want to get paid once and then they can just use your voice forever and do whatever they want with it. Um, and then there's also infringing on intellectual property from more of like a content creator perspective. So, um, you know, there's people who write fan fiction for the fun of it, for the love of it, and these AIs have most definitely scraped fan fiction corners of the internet because they can produce things that nobody in the world has heard of except this one little subreddit about this fan fiction where they created this little world together. Um, and the AI knows about it, so we know that they scrape these things. So we know that they're doing it. I mean, everyone's aware of that. Um, but that's, that's somebody's thoughts and ideas that they willingly uploaded to this free service where, you know, just for the love of it, for the fun of it, for fan fiction, you can just write what you want and, and have people read it and... Now, do you want to do that? Because now AI is just stealing your intellectual property. Even though you didn't get paid for it, now someone else is getting paid for your work. Um, and then as far as bloggers and other content creators, that's where, you know, Google used to be kind of the phone book to the internet, right? You wanted um, somebody to tell you which paper towel was the best. There were bloggers who 
were out there like trying these paper towels and they had images and just facts and would break everything down for you and you could trust them because you tried some of their products before and they do such good reviews and they provide you all of this content. Um, because of the generative AI and because of the AI summaries, Google has cut uh, traffic to those sites. Like a bunch of content creators have shown their analytics and there is a clear drop after Google changed the way that it does its uh, SEO and, and ranking. Um, and so the question is, if we aren't making money as bloggers and content creators and we're no longer getting traffic and we're no longer making anything, are we going to still blog if no one's going to be seeing our content? Um, you know, word of mouth can only do so much, hey, go check out my blog. You, you'd have to have the URL because Google's not going to take you there. ChatGPT is not going to take you there. It's just going to give you an answer. And if these content creators and bloggers, like all of the people who support Drupal and who write about Drupal, and you know, I've been on a Mike Madison blog before and was looking up how to use something. Um, if they're not creating that content, then suddenly ChatGPT doesn't know these things either. Um, a few years from now, when if people stop making this content, ChatGPT won't have that knowledge. And it's not designed to answer your question, it's just designed to respond. It, it doesn't need to be right, it just needs to sound right. And especially if it doesn't have good data on whatever you're asking it about, that's the, the, the what's the word? The, uh, the probability of it, of it hallucinating is much higher if it doesn't have the data. And even the best tools, 3% chance uh, that it will hallucinate. And I think that's it's 3% to 23%. Um, depending on the tool you're using. Uh, so that's exponentially increased when it doesn't have the data, it doesn't have the content. Um, so if people stop contributing to Stack Overflow, if people stop putting answers on Reddit and other subreds, if people stop contributing to Drupal and stop creating blogs about Drupal, how are people going to learn? How, you know, not everyone can come to GovCon. Uh, we're very fortunate that, that we could make it out here. Um, but not everyone can do it, or, or they they're not they're not aware of it. You know, uh, I was in Drupal for a while before I knew that GovCon existed. Um, so it's it's a it's a real you know question in my in my uh, opinion. There was Stack Overflow actually signed up with OpenAI and gave like allowed. I mean, they already scraped them, right? They scraped them without permission, but then they came back and they made a deal and. Stack Overflow was paid by OpenAI to scrape its answers. Um, but there was a whole forum and a thread on LinkedIn where people were talking about this. And some people were excited because, yeah, ChatGPT gives better answers anyway, or at least ChatGPT won't be mean and snarky in their answer. <laughs> um, but then there were a lot of people who said, you know, I was contributing to Stack Overflow because I thought I was teaching the next generation of developers. Now suddenly I'm teaching my replacement, you know? And if people stop contributing to these open source things that we all use and love, then ChatGPT won't have it either. And then suddenly it's just going to be eating itself and it's not going to be a useful thing. Um, so now that I've said all of these uh, costs, <laughs> does anyone have any others in mind? Yeah. yeah I heard that big, some servers are being used for Bitcoin and AI at the same time. I'm not sure how. Because of the energy costs and how they're together. Yeah, I have not heard of that, but Bitcoin is also uh, horrible for the environment. So, yes. Um, anybody else have any? Yeah? So, um, you mentioned about bloggers, content creators, but that, I mean, if you take that a step further, like you're talking about open source costs, really all of the sites that we work on could potentially be completely null and void if they're asking you know, AI to just generate a summary of the content. Um, and so people actually won't even get to any of the sites. For sure, for sure. I mean, only some of the generative AI out there actually links you to what, to where they got its response, right? Because it's not completely making this stuff up. It's, it's pulling from things and rewording it and paraphrasing it and giving it to you. It's a very good finish the sentence, right? <laughs> Um, and so I, 
I do like to use the ones that, that tell me where it's getting the information, and then I can go verify, and sometimes it's completely wrong. It has yeah. totally hallucinated. I'm like, where did you find this in this blog? Like, I don't see it. Um, and another little anecdote is I have a friend, uh, him and his wife got married, and I couldn't remember um, uh, when or, or something, so I was like, oh, let me just type their name into Google, and it'll t bring up their uh you know, what is it called, like a gift, wedding whatever, registry. wedding registry, thank you. So I typed in their names, and I got a little uh, summarized AI thing, and it said that they got married in California. I was like, no, they didn't. They got married in Maryland. So what are you talking about? Um, and I clicked through, and they had the same first and last name, two of them, but then the other one, the first name was different. So it had combined this couple in California and this couple in Maryland and had created an AI thing about them. Um, which is, again, it didn't have enough data to properly answer that question for me, and I don't know why it even tried. Um, and then just to add to that, like, because of those factors, and because, I mean, I think that most of the people here while we're in the government, trust is an issue already. Mm -hmm. and this only further adds, like, uncertainty about the information that's gathered, whether it's accurate. Right, or right. Exactly, and I, I went to a wonderful presentation uh, yesterday at GovCon. Um, Philippa Martin talked about rules as code, which I wasn't familiar with, um, and I'm running out of time, so I'll just say it really briefly, but um, it's taking your legislative code and actually making it machine readable. So like, uh, you know, person is the variable, is 18, check, uh, therefore can own a car, or something like that, right? Um, and she was using this in New Zealand and France, and I think there was one American example um, where someone could go in and just answer a quick web form drop down. It kind of reminded me of how TurboTax and H&R Block do our taxes, where you can just answer these brief little web forms, and then it spits out the legislative response in like a readable answer for you. Um, and she made a good point that having rules as code would be a good way to kind of check that AI response. So if you are going to provide me an AI response, I want something that's more hard-coded, more directly to the legislation that can confirm whether this is true or false. Um, all right, so then what can we do? Pause, right? Ask yourself, do I need to use this right now? Is this really going to answer this question better than I can? Um, you know, is it, going to just give me garbage code and so maybe I don't need it? Or is it going to help me draft my response and at least give me a good start? Um, just think about, do I want to pour out a bottle of water to get this answer, right? Um, and there's, there's certainly uses for it. Like, I've, I've gotten help from it. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to play with AI-generated images anymore. Now that I'm more aware of the environmental costs, I'm like, you know, looking at a cow turtle is funny, but not worth it to me anymore. Um, you can also opt out of AI integrations and AI ingestion. Like Slack said that all three, uh, all three Slack channels, they were going to just ingest all of your text and comments and stuff unless you opt out. And so my team chose to opt out. Um, then you can also seek alternative options. Uh, me personally, I don't want my Google Docs to train AI, or I don't want these things. Um, so then you could use ProtonMail or different uh, servers, not, uh, searches like Quant or Firefox, um, Brave, DuckDuckGo, you can use alternative options. Also think before you share. If it feels like misinformation, it might be, right? <laughs> right? So just verify and, and just, you know, give pause before you just start sharing content that you think is funny or uh, that makes you angry because it might be fake. And, even if you know it's AI generated, maybe other people don't. So that's another thing you could do. You could say, I'm pretty sure this is AI, but this is really funny, you know, and then share it in that way. Um, and then you can also use tools that may safeguard your intellectual property. If anyone's a graphic designer um, and hasn't heard of Nightshade, I recommend checking it out. Um, it's, you know, it's still like in early stages, but it's trying to poison your image so that it will train the AI the wrong way, which I think is really cool. Um, and then we can also seek for transparency in AI. You know, how much energy does this generative AI system use? Because there's a ton of them, right? And they all kind of seem to do the same thing, but they all do it slightly differently. And they all have different sized models. And so the bigger the model, maybe the more accurate, maybe not, um, but the more energy for sure that it used. And 
Um, how biased is it? How accurate is it? Which one uses less water? Um, maybe where where are your servers located? Right? Like literally, uh, back in the day, we would call people after 9 p.m. or we would do our laundry late at night to save on energy costs. So. If we know that our servers are located in specific locations, maybe we can search at times of the day where it's uh, more friendly to the environment. Um, we can also ask where did it get its content? And then if we have more transparency in AI, AI, we can choose which model is right for us. And then just remember that it's not all bad. There are good uses of AI more generally, um, like people trying to uh, track and prevent wildfires using AI, people finding people in rubble and after natural disasters, they are using AI to better track people in that you know, nice way of helping people. <laughs> um, and then also for accessibility, you know, speech to text is really helpful for a lot of folks. And there was one example of generative AI being used by uh, Data for Progress. Um, a senior fellow created a chat GPT based bot so that people with disabilities who didn't feel as comfortable writing their own comments, but they still wanted to talk to their politicians, they used that chatbot to help draft their comments so that they could feel like they were using their own voice to contact their uh, politicians. And that's that. Oh, wait, there we go. Uh, so if anyone has a desire to learn more or to know where all of this came from, um, I have a repository on GitLab with just a readme file with all of the links um, or at least most of the links. Uh, I care a lot about this, <laughs> if it's not apparent. So I've been reading stuff for a while. Um, but since I decided to do this presentation, anything that I read after that decision, I tried to collect into this repo so that um, you can read up more on it or you know make your own opinions. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, so I was kind of surprised this year that my Division I work for released a statement kind of saying AI is okay as long as you do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. like, is this something where the, the team will ever go back to the bottle, do you think? Is there any sign that like, the government might get sued and say, you know, we're not going to do this anymore? Or is it just, this is always going to be a thing and we just have to. I would, I would hope that the government would do more due diligence than some of the private people that got in trouble so that they might not get to that point where they would get in trouble. And yet New York City is already bungling everything. So, um, you know, in my mind, I know like people yelled about the fountain pen ruining writing and people yelled about the ballpoint pen ruining writing. So we, there's definitely that, right, of like technology is going to happen. And yet where's the metaverse? right? <laughs> Do we have the metaverse? That was the big hype. Bitcoin was the big hype. Now AI is the big hype. So it's probably not going to go back in the bottle. Although I am kind of feeling like generative AI. I feel like a year ago it was here and everybody was like, yeah, it's great. And now after like the Google debacle and like some other things happening, I feel like people are starting to recognize that it's not the just magic tool. Um, and there are some people out there who think that AI is already starting to degrade because it's now eating AI generated content. Um, so I don't know, but probably not because it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle, but uh, you know, one could maybe hope that we could at least steer in a better direction than I feel like we were headed. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about machine learning several years ago and you know, part all the economic impacts is because we want to create these models and process them with these big models and they need to be processed fast. So the way to do that is to put it in the cloud and use all its infrastructure and electricity. Uh, but you know, at its core, back many years ago, machine learning is, you know, you can, you can run machine learning, generate a model on your laptop in a store or a computer desktop in a smaller amount of time. Uh, and to do some of the same things, um, you know, you're not going to get results. But that could be an alternative for uh, training a lot of time sensitive. Yeah, for sure. If you, especially with like content and like you were saying, the 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 government can ensue. Like, um, you could definitely create your own. You could use open source models that are already out there instead of using the big name ones you can build your own model it's more you know time consuming for your devs but 
to me, that feels like a better way to do it because now you're, you're trading it on a much smaller data, right? Because it's just your agency or just your company's data. And then you're training it so that it just has, at least you hope, the right information. But how many people have content on their internet that's outdated or their external website that's outdated? So even your content could not be the best to feed these uh, models. But I definitely think that's the better way to go than to outsource and use different products that could potentially you know, get you sued or in trouble. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, on the topic of water and energy use, um, I was informed, or full disclosure, an executive I know was informed by a big name consultant that was then relayed to me that uh, there's a little more movement in the policy space on tracking energy use for AI and that problem started in Europe, but I, since I didn't have access to that consultant, that like with AI, with really your sources, mm -hmm. um, do, do you have any indication that there's movement in that space? Uh, just from reading, it, it sounds like it's, it's slow. I feel like it was very slow, and now it's kind of having an uptick. Um, okay. where people are starting to think more about it. And, you know, um, one of my sources is from Microsoft telling, telling you about how much water their, their servers are using. So I think there is some pressure on the companies to start being more transparent. Um, and I think as, as we continue to communicate that and inform people of that, there will be more pressure. Um, and there's certainly definitely calls, like especially from the White House and above, um, for regulation, and I think part of that would be cracking down on some of the environmental things, at least I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, maybe this is speculative, but in a way, is that kind of a quantifiable, easier problem to solve than AI in general? You know, kind of, right? Uh, it's, it's, I think it's difficult because it's so hidden, because okay. we have done such a good job of you know, people think the internet is, is clean, right? Like, yeah. there's there's not, like, where is the internet, right? Like, you don't physically see those servers unless you live in Des Moines or you live in Phoenix and yeah. it's right in your backyard, yeah, it looks but. It's like a shiny Apple product. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like, oh, something, like, is it a factory? Is it, a, like, what is it, right? And it's probably a data server, like, especially in Northern Virginia. Apple box. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think once we get past that hidden aspect and we start talking about it and we start informing people, and, you know, I have, I have some environmentalist friends who use AI, and I think if I told them these things, like I'm planning on telling them these things and then seeing, are they going to continue to use it to write their headlines or to generate some SEO things, right? Um, because I think people just aren't as aware of it. So once we get past that hurdle of communicating and, and informing people that this is a problem, then it does become a quantifiable thing to solve, as long as we're willing to solve it, right? But if we're just like, no, we just want to keep growing and growing and growing, and, and we're just going to keep, you know, 100, 100 data ser servers in a, in a year, um, yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's a policy change, communications, information, and then a desire to actually not kill the planet, which, you know, is controversial. <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, no, I, I, I... I was going to make a comment, but I need to Okay. All right. Yay. You're a person. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Anybody want to comment? Funny thing they saw on chat GPT? No? Anything? You know, uh, I had a coworker of mine say something that you reminded me of. Just the idea of, like, um, AI and, like, false results and everything that we're getting is uh, diminishing the already, like, uh, trust and things people use see on the internet. Right. And it phrased it in a really good way that I really love. And there's something along the lines of like, um, we're going from don't believe everything you see on the internet to don't believe anything you see on the internet. Yes. Yes, like yes. exactly. Uh, yeah, did you remember? Uh, yeah, so to phrase it in a way that, that so you can go get confirmation yourself on Drupal.org for content and issues and code that you're submitting and contributing to the Drupal community on Drupal.org. Uh, Again, uh, you can confirm this uh, the talk. It gives the rules to use AI for content. Uh, you can go to the there is full disclosure when you use AI to code and content. So, yeah. Yeah.
decision. I guess we clearly uh, mentioned that here of your decision to die. Yet uh, I, I need to find the exact uh, documentation page mm -hmm. uh, to confirm that. So please confirm for yourself. You know, when you're using AI on Drupal.org, uh, this is some code or, or web documentation. And go ahead and confirm the use of AI policy. Mm -hmm. uh, set up by the uh, Drupal Association. When I, I, I had a lot of code questions for one particular task, and ChatGPT would give me the wrong answers one after another, and then I would say, no, that's wrong, and they would say, oh, I'm so sorry, I apologize for my mistake, and then I would do it again. So I now I notice that when I ask a code question, the first answer on Google is from ChatGPT. But if I go to the right, you've got a Stack Overflow question, the answer. I trust the Stack Overflow answer a lot more right, than the, one, right. the first one that they're giving as if it was Right. Yes, for sure. And I've definitely experienced, um, I've, I've asked some Drupal related questions and I'll, I'll get back some code or some answers and it's, it's deprecated. It's all yeah. Drupal 7 yeah. because those are the blogs that it's been consuming and we have so much content out there about Drupal 7 and not as much about 10 and 11. Um, so it's just going to continue to give us outdated deprecated code and it's only going to get worse if people aren't creating that new content to feed the AI, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have a comment or question? Uh, maybe a comment. Um, I'm curious, and I'm certainly not in the way, um, if this will create market pressure to better efficient desalination. Mm -hmm. hmm. That would be a long time. You know, it's, water is a finite resource, so it would be good to have desalination plants for sure in the future. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll we'll see. <laughs> yeah. General tip: in case you didn't already know, when you do a Google search, there is, in addition to whatever videos, images, etc., there is like a web thing. You can Google what that. You can search for what that means. I won't get into it this a lot of time, but there's like one of the options is web, and that gets you a less AI skewed mm. set of results. Mm. Okay. I, I believe you can also opt out of the AI generated I summaries. Okay. I don't log in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah, if you log in. And somebody it. created a website where it does Google with that already in there for you because of course right. the internet is actually great sometimes. But anyway, you look for web and then you can get yeah. mm -hmm. Google. Anything else? We're out of time, but uh, any last comments? Anything? Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for coming.